<gasps> Diabetes ahead! Diabetes is one of these primordial diseases that is going to be on every single one of your tests. So you have to reduce it down to saying, I have to walk into that test knowing about diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary disease. So let's review for a second a couple of the basic differences between type 1 and type 2 disease. We don't really like to call it adult onset diabetes anymore because you can have type 2 diabetes happening in children. So the onset of always though, type 1 diabetes is a juvenile disease always because you're allergic to the beta cells of your islets from the time you are born and it presents always as a child. A type 2 diabetes is more often as an adult but it has to do with your, your obesity begins. So if you're really overweight and really obese as a child, then you'll get it when you're as a child. So because a juvenile diabetes means you don't have any insulin and you have a chronically elevated sugar that's going out in your urine, you're going to lose all those calories in your urine and you're going to be losing the calories in your urine and be thin. However, type 2 diabetes is because you just don't make enough insulin to support your already rather large body. Yes. Now, because of juvenile diabetes, you have a tremendous chronic lifelong deficiency of insulin, you're much more likely to be able to have a person with DKA more often. Now, both can cause DKA. You can have DKA with both of them, but DKA is just much more common with type 1 diabetes because you have less insulin, no insulin, deficient in insulin. Whereas in type 2 diabetes, you just have insufficient insulin. Type 1 diabetes always needs insulin replacement. Type 2 diabetes, 25% of the people will get better with diet and exercise and weight loss. 25% of the people will never need to be on a diabetes medication if they lose enough weight and exercise. Remember, 20 minutes of aerobic exercise is enough to put GLUT2 receptors and GLUT4 receptors, GLUT4 receptors in your glutes. I am for your glutes. Scotius Maximus. So it's enough to put type 4 uh, GLUT receptors, GLUT4 receptors in your butt for 24 hours. 24 hours. Because it's not just when you're exercising, the, the muscles actually have a sustained increase in glucose transport receptors and it sucks all the sugar out of your bloodstream. There are half a dozen classes of oral agents and it's not going to be clear on your test, whether you should go to three agents and four agents that are oral or go to insulin, not super clear. But then again, your test is not going to be engaging in cutting edge or controversial things. It will do new things like, oh, HPV vaccine is now up to age 45. Okay, well, that's just changed. It's changed. That's age 45. Okay, that's the answer. Uh, they will not do a lot of avant-garde stuff about lipid management because it changes every year. Or hypertension is the cutoff for hypertension. 140, 150 in people over 60, 150 in people over, six, over 60, age of 60. Or is hypertension 120 over, where is it? Not clear. It changes all the time. 10 separate organizations. Oh, shingles vaccine lowered to age 50. Definite. Screening hepatitis C, everyone born between 1945, 65, 45, 65, clear. Should we use three or four oral agents before going to insulin? Not so clear. They're going to avoid it. Now, here's something that is super clear. Super clear is how do we make the diagnosis originally of diabetes to begin with? We are looking at glycosylated hemoglobin. And if you had to choose one thing, if you had to choose one test, whether it's two fasting glucoses or one random glucose with symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, or an oral glucose tolerance test, if you had to choose one single test, the one single test is hemoglobin A1C. Why? because you only have to do one test, whereas two fastings, two tests. Number two, waiting for people to have symptoms is not great because although it is certainly very specific, a glucose above 200 with symptoms of excess glucose is very specific, we can't be waiting for that. An oral glucose tolerance test is maybe the most sensitive test Oral glucose tolerance testing is the answer to what's the most sensitive test, but oral glucose tolerance testing is the most effective and the best test for pregnant ladies. 
in general, all of these are okay, but if you have to choose one, hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5% glycosylated hemoglobin. I put that at the bottom there just so you have to think it through. I don't want to give you that on top and then you'll be like, that's too easy. One single test tells the last three months. And we do not want to be waiting for symptoms to be able to make our diagnosis. Uh, the other part about this is who should be screened? Now, screening means you're asymptomatic. In other words, colonoscopy is not a screening test if you have blood in your stool. That's not screening. You got blood in your stool. Right? Upper endoscopy is never a screening test. We don't do routine screening for upper endoscopy. Oh, you have weight loss and blood in your stool, and the lower endoscopy is negative. Oh, you have dysphagia, and all the other tests are negative. That's not screening. Screening means you have a person with no symptoms and is healthy, and you're doing a test. Colonoscopy above age 50, HIV testing for everybody, hepatitis C born between 1945 and 1965. Oh, screening test. Smokers with 30 pack here. Smokers with 30 pack here at age 55. Those are screening tests. Are you symptomatic? So screening for diabetes are, is mostly it's people who are obese and have hypertension. But I want to be clear about whose recommendation you're supposed to be following. Because if you run up against people or you're on rounds or you're a family practice resident looking at these videos and your attending or your endocrinologist on your rotation said you should be screening for diabetes for this one, 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 we are not tested on step three of USMLA for the American Diabetes Association recommendations. That's not whose recommendations we're being tested on. We are tested on the United States Preventive Health Services Task Force. <whistles> United States Preventive Health Service. This is a governmental organization that you can trust. You can't ever work for drug companies. You can't work for drug companies. You can't own stock in drug companies. You can't be owned by the system. You have to have tremendous cleanness. And those people are the ones that we're tested on because they're the most clean. Clean, and everyone will agree. Uh, blood pressure, you know, uh, is it 120, 130, 140? I don't know, but when you get to above 140, that's definitely hypertension in the general population. Oh, you know, mammography should be 40 or 50. I don't know for sure, but I do know by the time you're 50, you should get it. Some people say 40, but everybody would agree on 50. Oh, screening for diabetes. Oh, family history and this and this. But if you have hypertension and hypertension and obesity. So screening for diabetes. It's so interesting, isn't it, that, that screening for the most primordial conditions like lipids, glucose, and diabetes actually are three of the least clear screening recommendations there is. And the reason that they're the least clear is that in order for a screening recommendation to have been studied, you have to say we're not going to screen half the population. And saying we're not going to test people for hemoglobin A1Cs and we're not going to check blood pressures and see who dies is really problematic. So the mechanism of type 2 diabetes has to do with Come on, you know, there's just too much of you to love. Your adipose tissue don't have enough insulin because the only way that sugar can get into adipose tissue is with insulin. Same with free fatty acids. Now, you don't need insulin to get sugar into your kidneys. That's secondary active transport. And secondary active transport is not dependent upon insulin. You don't need sugar. To, uh, you don't need insulin to get the sugar into your bowels because that's secondary active transport and secondary active transport does not need insulin. You don't need insulin to get your sugar into your brain because if we had an ancestor that needed insulin to get sugar into the brain, that ancestor has been darwin out of existence. But adipose tissue must have insulin to get in. Do you need insulin? for sugar and free fatty acids to get in to your muscles. Ooh, that's a hard one. 
And the answer for muscles is that you don't need insulin if it's an exercising muscle. Exercising muscle does not need insulin, but fat does need insulin. So if you are really obese, you get type 2 diabetes because you run out of enough tyrosine kinase receptors. So tyrosine kinase receptors is unique. It's not a peptide hormone receptor. It's not a steroid hormone receptor. It's its own unique receptor for insulin. And this is also, there's tyrosine kinase that works for insulin. And tyrosine kinase is a very important pathway of cancer treatment. I don't like to use the word chemotherapy, but there's cancer ke uh, treatments that work through inhibiting the protein production for a number of cancers through the tyrosine kinase receptor. So type 2 diabetes, diet, exercise, weight loss. Sure, lose weight, lose weight. Exercising muscle does not need insulin, and exercising muscle puts glute transport, GLUT4 receptors mostly, into the muscles, mostly, and they stay there for 24 hours. If you lose weight and you exercise, 25% of people will never need a diabetes drug. Now, the best initial therapy, 30 years ago is metformin, now it's metformin. Metformin works by inhibiting, metformin works by inhibiting, metformin works by inhibiting gluconeogenesis. Metformin works by inhibiting gluconeogenesis, and that's also in, also increases a little peripheral insulin sensitivity and works in obese patients. Sure, because it doesn't make you more obese. Does so, do sulfonyl ureas make you more obese? Do sulfonyl ureas increase weight? Yes, because the sulfonyl urea depolarizes those beta islet cells. The sulfonylurea depolarizes the beta cells and increases insulin. And insulin takes the glucose and free fatty acid and moves it into your cells, into fat cells. So sulfonylureas give more insulin. Insulin makes more fat, but metformin doesn't do that. Metformin mostly works by blocking new glucose formation in which organ? Metformin works in the liver. So it doesn't add weight. Cytagliptin, sexagliptin, lenagliptin, allagliptin, cytagliptin, sexagliptin, lenagliptin, albagliptin. The DPP4 inhibitors, they inhibit the metabolism of incretins. Incretins is GIP, GLP, GIP, GLP. Does, do DPP-4 inhibitors increase weight or decrease weight? G, uh, D, DPP-4 inhibitors increase insulin and decrease glucagon. But do they increase your weight? They don't increase your weight because they inhibit stomach motility. And that's why DPP-4 inhibitors and also giving incretins, giving incretins, exenatide, liraglutide, albaglutide, lixacenatide, decrease weight. Well, how can they decrease weight, DPP-4s? They're increasing insulin, decreasing glucagon, but they're increasing insulin. <gasps> yes, but the major effect is that they're decreasing gastric motility. Let's say it again. A 65-year-old man is placed on metformin for type 2 diabetes, not responding to diet and exercise. Despite the metformin, his blood glucose it makes him too sweet, and the hemoglobin A1c is not at target. Remember, the diagnosis of diabetes is 6.5%, but the target is to get under 7%. Why not have a target of 6%? Because then you become more prone to hypoglycemia. Not when metformin, but in general, more prone to hypoglycemia. So what's the next thing to do? Hmm. Uh, let's see, that's a DPP-4 inhibitor. Cytagliptin, saxagliptin, lenagliptin, allogliptin. These medications block the metabolism of incretins. Incretins increase insulin, decrease glucagon. Hmm. Starting insulin after just one drug, I think it's too aggressive. Starting an insulin pump after one drug, too aggressive. Glitazones, not first anymore. Not second anymore. 
Glitazones can be used, but they're a third or fourth line drug. Why not the glitazones? Uh, well, what killed glitazones first and second is that glitazones, rosy glitazone and peel glitazone, uh, worsen fluid overload and they have some cardiac problems. Uh, so glitazones are never first and second. Acarbos and Miglitol. Those drugs are block the product, they block the absorption of glucose in your bowel by inhibiting disaccharidases. A carbose, isn't that a great name? I'm without carbohydrates. A carbose. A carbose and miglitol work by inhibiting disaccharidases. So instead of absorbing sucrose, instead of absorbing lactose, instead of absorbing the sugars, it goes out into your. So a carb and miglitol are very. It's like becoming lactose intolerant. And people don't like the diarrhea and the <laughs> gas. Switching to sulfonylurea. We don't switch off the metformin, and sulfonylureas are not as good as we used to think they are because sulfonylureas, because they increase the amount of insulin, have such a great increase in the risk of hypoglycemia. Also, where they have such a big increase in insulin, they cause more hypoglycemia. The second thing is, what bad thing in diabetes does a sulfonylurea do for you that we don't like in type 2 diabetes? Sulfonylureas will make you gain weight because they increase insulin. So the insulin brings your glucose and free fatty acids in. In where? Into fat tissue. Oh, but citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, allagliptin increase insulin. Citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, allagliptin increase insulin by blocking the metabolism of incretins. Now, some of the problem that we're going to have here is the terminology. This word incretin is a pain in the butt. What does it mean, incretin? Incretins are GIP and GLP. Oh, that's not much clearer, Conran. Correct, it's not much clearer. So we have three different names for these things. One, we can call them incretins. Next, we can call them GIP and GLP. But GIP and GLP stands for glucose, insu glucose insulinotropic peptide. That's 10 syllables. Wow. Glucose insulinotropic peptide? <gasps> what that is, is a, it's a, um, a hormone that when you take uh, sugar into your bowel, into your guts, uh, it causes uh, the release of insulin from your pancreas because the sugar touches the duodenum. Oh, and GLP? Again, oh my goodness. GIP, GLP, these are incretins. What does that mean? They increase insulin, decrease glucagon. GLP. Glucagon-like peptide. Glucagon-like peptide? So it likes glucagon. No, it doesn't like glucagon. But you just said it likes glucagon. No, I said it's glucagon-like. So it likes glucagon. No, no, it doesn't like glucagon. Wouldn't you speak the English language? All right. It's glucagon-like, meaning it's similar to glucagon, but the effect is, is it decreases glucagon. Glucagon raises sugar. So those are why this is, this is why this is such a difficulty. Incretins is GIP and GLP. GIP and GLP is glucose insulinotropic peptide. GLP is glucagon-like peptide. And the net effect is this. Incretins increase insulin and decrease glucagon, which lowers blood sugar. So if they increase insulin, how come they don't low, uh, raise your weight? How come they don't increase weight gain? Because incretins slow gastric motility. Insulin slow the bowel. And if you slow the bowel, you don't eat as much. So it's a little like a minor gastric banding. They slow the bowel. Uh, look, that uh, seems like a difficult uh, uh, explanation, but I gotta tell you is that it's not, and if you know it, you need to know it, you need to know it. The incretin mimetic drugs, because they block the metabolism of incretins. Metformin is first, blocks gluconeogenesis. You don't have hypoglycemia. What's the biggest problem with, with, the, uh, with metformin? 
The biggest problem with metformin is that it uh, has a small risk of lactic acidosis if you have renal insufficiency, and also if you use anything that might cause renal toxicity, like contrast agents, you got to stop it when there's contrast agents, renal toxicity, contrast agents, renal toxicity, contrast agents, because then if you have an increase in creatinine, the metformin might cause its lactic acidosis. Let's try it again. Here's your liver and your muscle. What a great picture that is. I love it. So the muscles don't release sugar when it comes out of the glycogen stores in muscles. Muscles have glycogen. Of course they have glycogen. We want uh, sugar storage in our muscles because then we can run away from dinosaurs and live. Run away. Yes, our ability. There may have been our ancestors that didn't run away, but they're not our ancestors. They were lunch for a saber-toothed tiger. So it doesn't release the glucose until it's metabolized all the way down to poo-poo called lactate. The lactate gets recycled into sugar in the liver. And what happens with metformin is metformin blocks this recycling of lactate into sugar. And so you don't release glucose. Now, in more biochemistry than you need to know for a step three exam, you, all you need to know is that sugars don't get out of the uh, muscle because the muscle needs it for energy. But sugars do get out of the liver because the liver wants to make sugar and release it to the rest of your body for energy. So it's only blocking the production of new sugars and it's only blocking the production of new sugars and that's why Metformin does not lower your sugar because it's only blocking the production of new sugars. Metformin is contraindicated with people in whom I might have a chance of lactic acidosis. Who gets an increased risk in lactic acidosis? Of lactic acidosis is it people who might accumulate the metformin. When you have renal insufficiency, the metformin might accumulate and cause a lactic acidosis. That's who it's contraindicated in. It's with contrast agents because what if there's a 1 or 2% chance of renal insufficiency with a contrast agent? Metformin would accumulate and therefore if you're going to have a contrast agent, we got to stop metformin because we don't want there to be renal insufficiency from the contrast agent and then maybe you get this toxicity of metformin. That's why all patients, when it says contrast agents, the answer is hold the metformin. Stop the metformin so you don't get lactic acidosis. Now, what if the metformin doesn't work? Ah, the second agent is not so clear. Now, uh, this is one of those that if it provokes you and you learn this and somebody says, no, uh, as a second agent, uh, the second agent can be a sulfonylurea, the second agent can be a glitazone, Rosy glitazone, okay, the second agent can be a glyptin. All of those are okay. All of those could be. These drugs, gliburide, glimepuride, glipizide, increase insulin. What's the problem? They make you have a notorious for causing hypoglycemia, and they're notorious for causing weight gain. Uh, rarely causes SIDH. Now, you notice what's not there in the sulfonylureas? Tolbutamide, chlorpropamide, extinct medications, extinct medications. Second agent, it's highly unlikely that your test will ask you to choose between a glyptin and a sulfonylurea as a second agent. You can see that in the previous multiple choice question, we said to use a glyptin because that is the flavor de month. Now, DPP-4 inhibitors. What does dipeptidyl peptidase do? Dipeptidyl peptidase metabolizes incretins. Incretins, GIP, GLP, raise insulin, lower glucagon. So if you inhibit the enzyme that breaks them down, Cytogliptin, sexagliptin, lenagliptin, allagliptin. You keep the incretin levels up, and the incretins, glucagon-like peptide, which doesn't like glucagon, inhibits it. And GIP, used when I was in medical school, it was actually used to be called gastric inhibitory peptide, 
gastric inhibitory peptide because we didn't know uh, that it had an effect on insulin, but we did know it slowed the stomach. So the first action of, of incretins was gastric motility. We knew it slowed gastric motility a long time ago. That's why they don't cause weight gain. And they increase insulin without the weight gain. Ah, oh, therefore they won't make you gain weight. So these drugs, sulfonylureas, can be used as the second agent. Ah, oh, let's go our own way here and see, look, when we have sugar, sugar in the lumen, sugar in the duodenum, sugar in the duodenum increases incretins, GIP and GLP. And the incretins go to your pancreas, the beta cells, and increase insulin release and decrease glucagon. So the sugar touches the duodenum. The duodenum makes the GIP and GLP. Hallelujah. The acid touches the duodenum and makes secretin. Secretin makes bicarbonate. Oh. So in type 2 diabetes, the third drug, usually after you're on metformin and a DPP-4 drug, and the sulfonylurea, the third, the fourth drug, the thiazolidine dions, rosiglitazone and pioglitazone, and they work by increasing peripheral insulin sensitivity, so now you have multiple mechanisms. Metformin decreases gluconeogenesis. DPP-4 inhibitors increase insulin, decrease glucagon. Sulfonylureas increase insulin. Thiazolidine dions increase peripheral insulin sensitivity. Why do they worsen congestive failure? I don't know, but they do. So why are these drugs third or fourth or fifth or not at all? Because they cause congestive failure, they cause fluid overload, and that is much worse. Why? Because they do. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors are usually not used. Well, why do you have to learn about them? Because the question will say, a patient comes to you on five diabetes medications. A new one has been added in the last week. The patient stopped all his medications because the patient developed diarrhea, gas, abdominal pain. Diarrhea, gas, abdominal pain. Diarrhea, gas, and abdominal pain. Which of them is most likely to have caused this? Which of the following will you stop? And the answer is alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. And that is why step three insists that you know adverse effects. Efficacy in terms of what's the best drug? Five years ago, the thiazolidine dions were great. Seven years ago, eight years ago. Now they're third, fourth line drugs. But adverse effects are always rock solid stable. Hypoglycemia with sulfonylureas was true 40 years ago. Hypoglycemia with sulfonylureas is true now. Adverse effects don't change. Adverse effects are clear. They block the absorption of glucose, leading you to have diarrhea and abdominal pain because they make it so that you break your lactose intolerant. So blocking this inside the bowel has turned out to not be a great idea. But blocking these things in the kidney so that the kidney blocks the reabsorption of glucose. Isn't it kind of the same thing? SGL2 drugs blocking absorption? Then why is it different? The SGL2 drugs in the kidney than these in the bowel. Very simple, because you don't get flatulence through your penis or through your urethra. You don't get all the bloating and diarrhea by SGL2 drugs in your urine as you do like becoming lactose intolerant. Insulin secretagogues, these medications are essentially the same thing as sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas are insulin secretagogues. Secretagogues means it increases the stimulation of the secretion. Nateglinide and repaglinide are basically alternatives to sulfonylureas and they don't add. What's your basic message here? These medications should never be added to sulfonylureas because it's like wearing two pairs of underwear, one on the inside of your pants, one on the outside. Uh, it's redundant. It doesn't help. You look silly doing it and has more side effects. SGL2 inhibitors. SGL2 is inside your kidney. 
in a way, they work with the same idea as the alpha uh, glucosidase inhibitors, a carbosamiglitol. But the difference is them blocking the reabsorption of glucose in the proximal tubule increases the excretion of glucose in your urine. So you filter the glucose, you just don't reabsorb it. Empagliflozin, canagliflozin, depagliflozin. So should these be the third drug? Should they be the fourth drug? Should they be instead of a thylazolidine dione? There's no answer to that question. Your answer to the question is, <gasps> adverse effects. Should this be the second drug, the third drug? Not clear. Oh, what adverse effect does it cause? Oh, well, when you don't absorb the sugar in your urine, your urine becomes so sweet. So what's the adverse effect of having all that sugar on your perineum sugar? And the answer is urinary tract infections and fungal infections of your vagina because your sugary perineum grows bacteria and fungus especially likes to eat sugar. That's Sabo Rhodes agar in how do you grow a fungus inside a laboratory, which is sugary agar. So this shows you, you filter the glucose, you're filtering the glucose, and when you filter the glucose, the SGL2 inhibitor prevents you from absorbing it, so it simply ends out in your urine. You filter the glucose, you filter the glucose, you decrease reabsorption, and the sugar spills out. It's kind of like an all-you-can-eat Italian restaurant with simultaneous liposuction. <laughs> Eat all you want. We're going to suck it out of you. GLP like animal. Whoa, what's the difference between that and the DPP4 drugs? What's the difference between these drugs and sitagliptin, sexagliptin, lenagliptin, allagliptin, sitagliptin, sexagliptin, lenagliptin, allagliptin? The difference is two things. These drugs are injected. Mm, but that's not a difference in effect. True, it's just a difference in route of administration. The difference is DPP4 inhibitors, sitagliptin, sexagliptin, lenagliptin, allagliptin, blocked the metabolism of incretins. So incretins stayed in increased amounts, GIP and GLP, increasing insulin and decreasing glucagon. These medications are actually injecting the incretins. What is the difference? Not a whole lot. It's the same idea. But because this is injectable, these are generally not going to be used until we get to a third and a fourth agent. If they increase insulin, how come they don't increase weight gain? Because they slow the bowel. They slow the bowel so much they slow the bowel so much, these are actually like weight loss medications. And that's why if they say the patient is very obese, this one is the best one to use because it makes you lose weight because it slows GI motility. GLP drugs are, used to be called gastric inhibitory peptides. Gastric inhibitory peptides slows the bowel. So we still get to call it GIP, keep the same three-letter abbreviation and it also does this little bit of different mechanism which is not just slowing gastric motility but the main effect is increasing insulin decreasing glucagon so if oral agents don't work and again should we go to three should we go to four should we go to five there's no answer to that then you combine a short-acting and a long-acting insulin. A long-acting insulin and things like glargine, detimer, deglutide, and you're not going to be asked to be choosing between them because all of those are okay. You can combine a long-acting insulin once a day with a short-acting insulin, excuse me, with a short-acting insulin with meals. Degludec is different because it has the weird thing where it's like a 36-hour half-life. 36 hours? Yes, so you... Less hypoglycemia. Oh, wait a second. I've heard of this. The first thing you do to choose a medication is you look at efficacy. But what if the efficacy is the same? Then you look at adverse effects. And this has less adverse effects because it's got a really long half-life. 
Yes, really long half-life. The short-acting insulins. Regular insulin is like that. Aspart, Lispro, Glulysine are about the same. You basically change one amino acid and you got a new insulin. So you have a long-acting insulin and then a short-acting insulin with your meals. Aspart, Lispro, Glulysine are abbreviations for the amino acid on the side of that insulin, which changes it a tiny bit and makes these ultra short acting insulins, they're more quote unquote physiologic. Aspart, glulysine, lispro, very short acting. Ins regular insulin lasts longer. <gasps> Detimer, glargine, and out there is degludec. So you use a long acting insulin and a short acting insulin with your meals. What do you do when insulin monotherapy does not control your glucose and you're just on insulin? You can add metformin. For those people who are type 1 diabetics or di insulin dependent diabetics who are still not controlled with insulin. Oh, you're type 2 diabetic and we put you on insulin. Oh, the insulin's not controlling you. Add metformin. You're a type 2 diabetic and you're still not controlled with insulin. Add metformin. Type 1 diabetes under production of insulin, much more simple, straightforward. Pancreas is destroyed. It's like vitiligo of your, of your pancreas. It's destroyed autoimmune attacking your pancreas. And your pancreas basically has gotten all damaged out so that basically you have to use insulin from an early age. And the patients are thin because this hyperglycemia means that the sugar starts spilling into your urine. The sugar starts spilling into your urine when your sugar level gets to about 200, it starts to spill. And above 200, it starts to spill even more. It won't respond to weight loss or exercise because this is not a peripheral resistance problem. This is a straight on ahead insulin deficiency problem. And you ha and sulfonylurea areas won't work because this is not a, you don't have a pancreas that can work. In other words, the pancreas, you can't just squeeze some more insulin out of it with a sulfonylurea or in the teglinide, repaglinide. So you have to use insulin. And because you're really deficient, you're more prone to DKA. These are the easy parts. And so people become really sick, particularly when they have DKA. Diabetic ketoacidosis, you're hyperventilating way hyperventilating because you're acidotic and the acidosis makes you hyperventilate. You have metabolic acidosis because the body switches over to eating ketones instead of using sugar because I don't have any insulin to get the sugar into cells. So the body switches to ketones, but ketones are acidotic. And the fruity odors from the ketones, the acetone in your breath. And when people get really high sugars, they get confused because your brain does not like extremes of osmolality. The diagnostic testing is not hemoglobin A1Cs and not fasting glucoses, but the how do you tell when you're on your step 3 CCS? When you're on your step 3 CCS, which single test will most accurately tell the severity of your diabetic ketoacidosis? Which single test? And it's not the glucose level. The glucose level is not the single most accurate method of telling severity. You can have a sugar of three and 400, take some insulin, and it's down within the hour. And also, a sugar of 200, 300, 400 does not mean you have diabetic ketoacidosis. A sugar in the hundreds does not mean DKA. And at the same time, a sugar that's only a little bit elevated by 200 doesn't mean you don't have DKA. The best initial test to tell severity is anion gap or bicarbonate level because this is telling you how acidy you are. Well, fishy, fishy, fishy. Why don't you say um, uh, uh, ketone levels? Why don't you say acetoacetate or beta-hydroxybutyrate? Why don't you say acetoacetate or beta-hydroxybutyrate? Acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate are the ketones. 
And that's a very good question, and the answer is very straightforward, which is that the ketones and the uh, measurements don't measure all the ketones, and you can be having markedly improved metabolic acidosis and still have some extra ketones floating around. So if you have some ketones that are positive, but you have a normal bicarb, you're not in DKA. If your ketones are negative, but you have a low bicarb, high anion gap, low bicarb, high anion gap, and your ketones are negative, even if you, and you have a low bicarb, high gap, you have DKA. So diabetic ketoacidosis is not based on the potassium level. It's not based on the glucose. It's sort of based on ketone levels, but the di diagnosis and definition of DKA is the A, the acid. And the acid is with the bicarb level and the anion gap, not the glucose level. These are the various ketone bodies. This is a fat poo-poo. I'd like to use glucose for my food, but I need insulin to get it into cells. And if I can't get the insulin to get the glucose into my cells, I have to have alternate fuels of so fuel sources so I can get some energy. And therefore, it is the garbage that then comes up with metabolizing free fatty acids. Now, even though ketone bodies and the presence or absence of them is not the strongest definition of DKA, and as a single best answer question, as a single best answer question, you're going to say serum bicarb and anion gap. As a single best answer question, you're going to see serum bicarb and anion gap. If you're on a CCS and you could order many things, you will order these on top because CCS, computerized clinical case simulation, is more like real life. It lets you add a little extra. You move the clock forward, and as it says the time the report is available, the ketone bodies will pop up. It's not as important as anion gap and, and, and the bicarbonate level, but it is suggestive. Now, why do you get hyperkalemia? when you have diabetic ketoacidosis. Why do you get the hyperkalemia? Because insulin normally drives potassium into cells. Do you know what the mechanism of that is? Why insulin drives potassium into cells? Because insulin and beta agonists stimulate sodium potassium ATPase. So insulin drives potassium into cells because insulin drives the glucose and the potassium in at the same time. So if you give insulin to anybody, anybody, you'll get hypokalemia. So that's why diabetic ketoacidosis, potassium comes out of the cells, giving insulin, potassium goes into the cells. The other thing is with diabetic ketoacidosis, if you have a hydrogen ion excess outside the cell, Hydrogen ions go into the cell. Hydrogen ions are cation. And if one cation goes in, another cation goes out. If one cation goes in, another cation goes out. That's why acidosis causes hyperkalemia and alkalosis causes hypokalemia. Okay, I gave bicarbonate. What happens to my potassium level? I injected bicarbonate into the body. What happened to my potassium level? Bicarbonate will lower the potassium level because bicarbonate drives potassium into cells because bicarbonate will make hydrogen ions go out. Potassiums go in. And that's why acidosis causes hyperkalemia, and alkalosis causes hypokalemia, DKA, hyperglycemia, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia with treatment because insulin will drive it into cells, hypokalemia with treatment because insulin will drive the potassium into the cells. And when the potassium level starts to come down to normal, when the potassium level starts to come down to normal, you have to supplement the potassium because if you don't, the potassium level will become dangerously low. This is your level of question on step three. 
DKA is a fantastic CCS question. You have to know to put them into the ICU. You have to know to give insulin intravenously at the beginning. You have to know that as the potassium comes down, you have to replace potassium even while the potassium level is still normal, just as the potassium level comes down. The labs in DKA, you can see the low pH on a, uh, an uh, arterial blood gas or on a venous blood gas. What The CO2 on the arterial blood gas is low because you're hyperventilating to compensate for the acidosis. You're hyperventilating to compensate for the acidosis. The acidosis makes you hyperventilate. Single best answer, I'm not getting the ketones. CCS, get the ketones. Oh, why do you get a pseudo hyponatremia? Why a pseudo hyponatremia? Because when the glucose level goes up, it pulls water out of the cells, dehydrates the cells, and the water goes into the vasculature. So when the glucose level goes up, the water comes out of the cells, and it makes the sodium drop. Looks like it drops. Pseudo hyponatremia. So for every 100 of glucose above normal, the sodium level looks like it is down by 1.6. Let's say it again. The glucose level is up. The sodium level goes down. It's a pseudo. It is not real. Treat the glucose. And as the glucose goes into the cell, the sodium will come up automatically. The treatment of DKA. Where should the patient be placed? Location, ICU. Treatment of DKA. They're in the emergency room. Medications first or transfer? Any life-threatening ill person, medications first. Labs first. We're not going to just transfer. Oh, I'm sorry you're so sick in our emergency room. My best management for you is to find you another doctor. Transfer. Transfer. What do you like in the honeymoon? I don't know how to handle you. We need to get you another husband. So, on the initial screen, what are you going to do? You're going to do a blood gas because if the pH is low, that's really bad. You need to go to the ICU. Severity. You need a sodium and glucose levels. If it's a CCS, you're going to also order ketone and acetone level. Give them a big bowl. It's a normal saline. How much? You can't order it. You can't say, is it one liter or two liter, three liter? Because you can't do dosing on CCS. You can't do dosing. It's impossible. So you say bolus and then continuous. And once the high glucose and the low bicarb are found, you order IV insulin, high glucose and the low bicarb, not just because of the high glucose, because high glucose alone is not DKA. High glucose and low bicarb is DKA. So the indication for the IV glucose is not the high, the indication for the IV insulin, the indication for the IV insulin is not the high glucose. The indication is the low bicarb. Here it is on one slide. Insulin will drive potassium into cells because insulin stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase. This is why when the potassium starts to come down to a normal level as you move the clock forward, you must replace potassium even though the potassium level may be normal. Why should I replace the potassium even if potassium is normal? Because it's going to continue to drop. And the more insulin you give, the more the it, potassium the more insulin you give, the more the potassium, the more insulin you give, the more potassium will go into cells. As the acidosis corrects, the potassium will drop. And when the potassium level comes to normal, you should give potassium in the fluids. Primordial, excellent CCS case. That total, hey, why is the total body potassium low? I thought you just said it's a transcellular shift. How come the total potassium is low? How come the total potassium, the total potassium is low because when you have this acidosis, acidosis causes hyperkalemia. And the high potassium gets filtered and excreted. 
So your total body potassium is depleted because the chronic hyperkalemia depletes the potassium. Oh, hyperkalemia is from transcellular shift because you have acidosis, the hydrogen ion, the hydrogen ion, the hydrogen ions going in and out of the cell. Acid enters the cell and potassium leaves the cell and the insulin later drives the potassium into the cells by stimulating sodium potassium ATPase. Now, the reason that I do this multiple times is because this is such a hot source of questions that it's really important to understand it all the way. You get an increased anion gap because without the glucose as a fuel, you get this crappy, without the glucose as a fuel, you start getting fat cells breaking down, fat cells releasing free fatty acids, and free fatty acids are turned into ketones, and ketones by themselves are acids. The ketone is an acid, and that acid drives down the bicarbonate. So what do you do on CCS? In terms of your orders and the complications of diabetes, remember on CCS, one, you can do some history and physical. Each part of the physical exam is one minute, except for the head and neck exam, the genital exam, and the rectal, which are two minutes. So the entire heart exam is a minute, but the rectal, no, two minutes. You can write some orders. Do orders mean tests or treatments? The answer is both. Is there a limit on the number of tests and treatments you can order? No. And you order them at the same time, as long as you hit return, return, they're all considered done at the same time. How do I get results of tests? Move the clock forward. As you pass the time that it says report available, the test result will come up. And location. The location, you have to make it fit into one of the five locations. You have to make it fit into the emergency room, home, office, ICU, regular hospital floor. So diabetes, uh, not for DKA, but for just regular diabetes, an excellent office-based case because there's so much you can manage over time. Diabetes and hypertension, the goal is at least 140 over 90. We are not going to change our books over the momentary flavor of the month with a recommendation coming out every 12 minutes. It should be at least 140 over ni under 90. Should it be lower? Not so clear. Maybe. What's clear? That's clear. The goal of LDL should be at least under 100. The blood pressure should be used, uh, controlled with, and this is a definite answer, with an ACE inhibitor for sure, and an ARB, ACE or an ARB. Looking at the complications, so the heart, the eye, the eye, the eye, look, I'm poking my finger in the eye, the kidney, it's very clear. Everybody needs to have their eyes looked at. Why? What are you going to do differently? I can laser the eye. I can use vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors. What am I going to do differently? I can treat it. Laser the eye vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors. Why do I need to look for microalbumin? Because microalbumin is an indication for ACE inhibitors. What can I do for the brain? Not much. I'd give a statin if the LDL is above 100. Blood pressure goals are not so fuzzy. That's why I'll use the word at least. Next, lipid management. You should use a statin when people, okay, I say statin when their LDL is over, under over 100, everybody should get a statin. They won't ask you which one, they'll say high intensity statins. If you have both coronary disease and diabetes, then the goal is under 70, if it's both. But then again, if you have coronary disease alone, the goal is under 70. So here's the point about some of these things about these goals like lipids and blood pressure. One year we say goals matter, the next year we say goals don't matter. So here's the paradox. Goals don't matter, but they should be at least under 70 if you have coronary disease and diabetes. That seems contradictory. It does seem contradictory because it's not clear. So we're gonna, they're gonna uh, dance around this by saying everybody with diabetes and LDL above 100 should be on a statin. With coronary disease, 70 on a statin. We're not clear you should treat the goals. Goals may not matter, but the goal should be at least under 70 if you have coronary disease. 
Ah, here's a clear answer. If you have no coronary disease, but having the presence of you have a particular blood pressure, you have a particular age, and maybe you smoke, and we calculate your 10-year risk to be 7.5%, this is an indication for high-dose statins. Goals, they're not going to ask you because the goal thing is not clear. Ah, 7.5% 10-year risk? Statins. Statins. Diabetic retinopathy. You should have every type 2 diabetic looked at every year. Why? Because you not only want to control the glucose with retinopathy, do you need to do, if you have proliferative retinopathy, what are you going to do if there's proliferative retinopathy? You're going to laser it. And if the laser is not controlling it, vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors, VEGFs, ranibizumab, bevacizumab, ranibizumab, bevacizumab, ranibizumab, bevacizumab to control that diabetic retinopathy. And this is why diabetes is no longer the most common cause of blindness in the United States because you're able to prevent this evil crap from happening with tighter glucose control, lasering the eyes, and VEGF inhibitors injected into the eyes. So the most common cause of blindness in the United States is macular degeneration. And these medications down here are actually the same ones that work for wet macular degeneration, found to also prevent diabetic retinopathy. We do a urinalysis and we do microalbuminuria because we want to prevent the kidneys from getting damaged because anybody who has microalbuminuria or proteinuria gets an ACE inhibitor. And because even microalbuminuria, microalbuminuria means that it's protein that is not enough to be found in an ordinary dipstick, but can be seen in the urine anyway, usually between 50 and 300 micrograms, 50 and 300 micrograms. Microalbuminuria gets, le gets an ACE inhibitor and prevents diabetic nephropathy. ACE inhibitor or ARBs. Now here's the big question for you. If, excuse me, if you don't have, if you don't have hypertension, you still get ACE inhibitors just because you have the protein urea. Now what is this? Why do you get neuropathy? Why do you get neuropathy in a diabetic? The diabetic gets neuropathy because what happens is that the blood vessels the blood vessels around the nerves get damaged. So the blood vessels, the vasonervorum, gets damaged like the blood vessels and the foot processes in this kidney get damaged. Like the blood vessels in these eyes get damaged. Microvascular damage, treat it. Microvascular damage, treat it. Microvascular damage in the blood vessels around the nerves. So there's nothing we can do for this one specifically except to control glucose levels for the diabetic neuropathy. But I want you to see that diabetic neuropathy has the same mechanism as the eyes and as the kidney damage, damage to the microvasculature. Why examine the feet? What can you do differently? The answer is always control glucose. What's the goal? Hemoglobin A1C less than 7%. What's the goal? Hemoglobin A1C less than 7%. Your most fundamental primordial questions for you on step three are this. Control the blood pressure. Control the glucose. Give ACE inhibitors if there's pro protein in the urine, any degree of protein in the urine. Make sure you look in their eyes before they start to get visual disturbance because once they start to get visual disturbance, it's too late. You can't reverse it. You can only prevent it. You get neuropathy, but there's nothing you can do for it specifically to prevent it except control glucose. Why look at the feet? Well, it's the bottom of the feet. Have you ever looked at the bottom? Can you look at the bottom of your feet? How do you look at the bottom of your feet, man? I don't know. You can let that flexible. 
Also, what reason do you do that? Unless it hurt. Well, if it hurt, you might look at it. But if it doesn't hurt, why would you look? You wouldn't. So people with diabetes, why would they look if it doesn't hurt? And if it doesn't hurt, they don't feel the ulcers because the nerves are destroyed and they don't feel the damage. Well, what can you do if you sense, look at the feet? What are you looking for? Decrease in sensation. Well, what can you do? Orthotics, better fitting shoes, various shoe devices that are more uh, less likely to damage the foot. And you're also more likely just to look before you get that ulcer, which goes on to osteomyelitis of the foot. ACE or ARBs, proteinuria. ACE or ARBs, first line drug in hypertension. ARBs, if you have a cough. And for neuropathy, if you actually have pain, it's straight to treatment. It's like erectile dysfunction. You don't have to use a, a, a test to prove it. Gabapentin, pregabalin, tricyclics, gabapentin, pregabalin, tricyclics. For diabetic neuropathy, gabapentin, pregabalin, tricyclics, gabapentin, pregabalin, tricyclics. Complications, erectile dysfunction. You don't have to do a test. Go straight to sildenafil, tadalafil. No routine screening test for penises. We're going to do routinely penis screening. This is sildena, sildenafil, tadalafil, sildenafil, tadalafil, vardenafil. It fills the weenie. What else do you get as a complication? Oh, I got early bloating, early satiety, abdominal pain, bloating, satiety, bloating, satiety, early abdominal pain, nausea, nausea, di- uh, nausea, bloating, constipation, alternating with diarrhea. Oh, I've got diabetic gastroparesis. What is the most accurate test? Well, there is a nuclear gastric emptying test. There is. You can give like barium-soaked bread and see if there's a a decreased mobility. But you generally don't do it if people have clear symptoms. It's like the neuropathy. If you have a decreased ability to perceive stretch, you don't move your feet. If you don't move your feet, you get diabetic neuropathy and you get ulcers in the bottom of your feet. If you don't perceive the stretch of your stomach, you don't have gastric motility and you get bloating and constipation and immobile guts. So the treatment of diabetic gastroparesis is to increase motilin. And how do we increase motile? How do we increase the motion of your diabetic guts? By giving you erythromycin, which increases motilin, or metoclopramide, which increases the motility. This is exclusively just to relieve symptoms so you don't have all the bloating of diabetes. The most accurate test is a gastric emptying study. We use barium-soaked bread, and you eat it, and you actually can see how long it takes for the bread to empty the stomach. You have mastered diabetes. Oh, oh, do not. I don't want uh, people obsessing over LDL cutoffs and blood pressure cutoffs uh, because uh, there's just too variable and too many guidelines for them to say one cutoff and it's going to change anyway. They'll always ask you something that everyone can agree on.